Hello everyone. Um, thank you. It's lovely to see all of you coming today for today's talk. And today we're very honored to have Professor John Butterworth. And so a bit of introduction to the speaker. Uh, Professor John Butterworth worked on the Atlas experiment at CERN LOC, which is the Large Hadron Collider. And he's also a professor of physics at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University College London. His research has focused on electroweak symmetric breaking, which includes the search for the Higgs boson. And he was awarded the Chadwick Medal and Prize of Institute of Physics for his work in uh, high energy particle physics, especially in the understanding of hydrogen jets. He's now working on using diffusion measurements. Uh, at the LHC to constrain and characterize physics beyond the standard model. And besides being a researcher, he is also a science writer, and he has written two books and many articles for the general reader. And now, let's hear from Professor Butterworth about CERN, the LHC, and all that. An update from the Energy Frontier. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, thanks for the invitation and the welcome. That was a lot less embarrassing than some of these 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 things can be. So, uh, but it did remind me I forgot to bring any books to sell. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I will talk about as I said the CERN, the Lab Hadron Collider, um, and what's been going on there um, since we started. Um, the the first talk uh, will the first part of the talk will be quite general, and I'll try and give you some idea of the state of play in particle physics at the moment. And then I'll finish towards the end. I will, rather than giving a more kind of generic talk that any LHC physicist could give, I will focus in on particularly on what I'm working. So it will get a little more technical towards the end. Don't worry. The first bit is the general intro. Um, but I hope that, so I hope someone gets something out of everything. I know people will have different levels of background knowledge. Just in, in case you feel this is a colloquium I gave, uh, it's based on slides anyway, uh, based on a colloquium that I gave at Grenoble University. A colloquium is a general physics talk, so it's not in particle physicists, but it is aimed at physicists. And that's where I figured I'd think it for you. So um, if I do, if things do get lost, I'm perfectly happy if you wave your hand and say, what did you just say there? Then, then that's fine by me and I'll. I'll I'll do the, the speed of the talk from that and the, the content of the talk from that. Um, okay, but anyway, start start with the point that not working. It was working before. Um, okay, that's not working. I noticed that. I think I have not. Yeah. Okay. So I just need to click on the Zoom window. Okay. So. Particle physics is about, um, I guess, the, mo the most formal uh, description you can sort of say. It's, it's about discovering and elucidating what the fundamental constituents of, um, of the universe are, matter, na nature are, and the forces between them, and, uh, and the forces that bind them together and um, essentially make them form the universe that we see around us. So there's many non trivial questions and assumptions in that. Right? There's no guarantee that there's a fundamental constituent okay you could ask you can pose the question if i break matter down into smaller and smaller pieces does it ever end it may, it may go on forever and obviously experimentally that's actually a question you can never ask never answer because if you build a bigger experiment maybe you'll find that there's some structure to the things that you thought were, were fundamental and um you know the, the the quantum mechanics analogy here or it's not an analogy the relationship between energy and frequency that, that if you go to high if you want to go to high energy that corresponds to high frequency in quantum mechanics D equals hf um, means that that high frequency is short wavelength so as you go up in energy you're probing smaller and smaller distances so if you want to say at the very smallest distances i can reach what are the fundamental constituents that's that's a question you can answer experimentally because you can reach them but you can never be sure that you reach the end of the chain. You can never be sure that if you built a better experiment with a short, higher frequency of probe and therefore with a shorter wavelength of probe, you might resolve more sort of structure. So when we say fundamental, it means different things to an experimentalist and a, and a theorist, I guess. Fundamental for an experimentalist is clearly an operational definition. It's something that we cannot resolve any structure inside. 
it's 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 a it's an object that has no extent and no internal structure. From a theorist's point of view, that's also the same definition, but, but you can make a more, a more um, concrete statement. And the standard model of particle physics is actually a theory of fundamental particles. There is a theoretical structure in which they can be fundamental, that they're point like that there's nothing inside them, and everything else is made of them, they're not made of anything else. That's kind of the context of, of particle physics. We're trying to find out what those things are. Um, and when we when we do, we find that there are quarks and leptons and there are a small number of fundamental forces between them. And the first fundamental particle then was discovered not far from here um, by JJ Thompson um, in, in working in the Cavendish lab. Um, and that's his experiment. That's his, his large lepton collider, I guess, up there. Um, and this is a, a zoom in on it. And you probably, given that you're at Cambridge, you've probably seen these things for real. I've seen them for real, some of them. Um, they're in the they're in the museum here. Um, but these were cathode rays, and um, this is more than hundred years ago now. Um, and he was, uh, and electromagnetism was fairly new and not super well understood. Although we had Maxwell's equations, we were still working things out, or they were still working things out. But what Thomson did was by applying electric and magnetic fields to the cathode rays and watching how they bent, uh, they were given off from the cathode here when you heated up a piece of metal with a with a voltage over it. He convinced himself that whatever they were, they were kind of the dark matter of the time. No one knew what they were. He convinced himself and eventually everyone else that whatever metal you had here, whatever voltage you applied, whatever magnetic fields you applied or anything, they were the same. They were charged and they were actually not waves, they were particles, they were electrons, of course. And in more than a hundred years of trying, we've we've never um, managed to break an electron. We've never managed to resolve any internal structure in an electron or smash one into pieces. We can annihilate them if we hit them with an anti-electron, but we can't break them into pieces. So they're, they're a fundamental particle. They're also the first subatomic particle to be discovered. They're much, much lighter than the lightest nuclei. And that was really the access point, the start, if you like, first of all, of atomic physics, then nuclear physics, then particle physics. And I'm going to use these, this map analogy um, throughout the talk because it's it's the way I think about what we're doing as experimentalists, actually, and you'll see that towards the end of the talk, how that fits in with what I worked on today. Um, but essentially, we're on these maps, you know, where we have the, the entry port here of um, the electron. And once we're in, on, on all these maps, kind of west to east is uh, lower energy to higher energy. So every day, physics up to the, the energy frontier in the east. And the first thing you, you realize when you do that, of course, is that it gives, because it's the first subatomic particle, it gives you access to the atomic physics. Um, that leads almost directly to quantum mechanics. It's the fact that you, you need the Bohr atom to try and explain why, why only certain um, atomic energy levels are allowed and things. Um, as you probe further, you discover that there's a nucleus in there, and Rutherford, Rutherford again doing his experiments, although I believe they were actually in Manchester, not while he was here. Um, but the, um, discovering that there's a hard nucleus in there, eventually discovering that that has neutrons and protons inside it, um, and that those neutrons and protons are part of a class of particles called hadrons, which have quarks inside them. And I'm basically exploring this whole map. I'm not going to give you a kind of any, really any more overview of the standard model or any more history. I just want this is the context in which we're, we're, we're doing physics now. What I want to do is focus on, as we go up in energy, what's going on on the fuzzy, edge of the, uh, the this island here, okay? And that's the region <clears throat> that the Large Hadron Collider was essentially designed to give us access to. So this is a kind of pre-Large Hadron Collider map where we kind of know there's some stuff here, but we don't really know what it is. And that region is very special. And to illustrate why that is so special, um, this is a plot from the experiment I worked on as a PhD student. Um, and this is an experiment that ran in Hamburg. Um, it was an electron proton collider. So, this is a, an electron coming in here, exchanging the photon, smashing the proton to pieces by interacting with a quark. And what you see in the plot is essentially what the cross section, the probability of that, that, that kind of um, collision occurring, the vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is the four momentum transfer squared problem. So, it's basically the energy squared. In that um, in that collision, which you can calculate by measuring the final state where the, where the scattered particles go, 
And the blue points are the, the, are the what we call the neutral current cross section. That means this, this wiggly line here, the, the propagator in the Feynman diagram is, is a photon or a Z boson. It's a neutral um, force carrier. And you see that, that, that the, the points of the data, the measurement and the, the theory is a solid line and it kind of agrees very well. Um, the perhaps the, the interest comes about then when you start comparing that to the red line, which is a charge current cross section, and that's when the force carrying particle that's exchanged here is a W boson, which is the force carrier of the weak interaction. Um, the weak and weak nuclear interaction being one of the, the four, the three fundamental interactions of the standard model, of course. So when the W is exchanged here, actually the electron transmogrifies into a neutrino because the charge is carried away by the W. The W boson, but that and the neutrino we can't directly measure, but luckily we can measure the, the, the bits of the smashed up proton and still determine the, determine the kinematics of the event. And the interesting thing here is well, first of all, let's note that the, 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 the experiment and the theory agree very well again in this case. But look what's happening the everyday energies, the electromagnetic interaction, the neutral current is much more likely to happen than the weak interaction. That's why we call it the weak interaction, it's very short range. Uh, it's a lot weaker than the um, than electromagnetism. However, as you go up, and remember we're going up in energy, so we're going down in resolution, we're becoming more sensitive to the short range of the weak interaction. The weak interaction is, once we get to within the range of the weak interactions um, and put these energies, there's the forces come together. In fact, their strength is the same as we got there. And in a sense, they're unified. Now, theorists will quibble about how deep is that unification because there's still have two symmetry groups associated with them, but they are the same strength. They do mix up at that energy. And physics looks very, very different once you get above this energy scale. This energy scale is called the electroweak symmetry breaking scale. Now, we kind of know something about why that happens. We know that the difference is actually because the W boson has got mass and that the photon which carries electromagnetic force does not have mass. But that kind of just kicks the can down the road. That just says, okay, you understand the unification in terms of mass, but where does the mass come from? How does the W boson have mass? And it turns out that's a very difficult question to answer theoretically and experimentally, because to build a theory with the right symmetries that has a massive force carrier is, is was math actually thought to be mathematically impossible. Um, until um, in the early 60s, Brad Englert and Higgs came up with a way to do it. And that's the first mention of the Higgs boson, the last elemental particle, which if Brad Englert and Higgs, uh, if their theory was right, which actually when they came up to it, we didn't even really know about quarks or W bosons. So they were, they were thinking very mathematically about how you evade something called the Goldstone, Goldstone theorem. Um, but they did it, and when when the when the rest of physics kind of caught up with them, it was there waiting to slot into the standard model and solve this problem. And it predicts that there is a um, that there's a new quantum field in the universe. That this quantum field has a non-zero expectation value even in a vacuum, and that it's interacting with that field is where the mass comes from, and that allowed them to retain the good symmetry properties of the standard model while giving the W and the Z boson and the other fundamental particles mass. So that, that was, but there's a key prediction there. If you've got this new field in the universe, how do you test it's there? And the answer, the, the, the test that is there or not is essentially hit it really hard and make it wobble, create an excitation in, in this background energy field. Much of the way is, is like, you know, me speaking to you is creating pressure waves in, in the atmospheric field of, of the room, that's one reason we know there's air in the room. And there's lots of other reasons we know there's air in the room. But with the Higgs field, because it's just everywhere in the universe, there's not that many ways of putting it. And the cleanest and most obvious, in fact, the only way we can really think of is to hit it really hard and hope you can excite a wave, a quantum excitation in this field. That quantum excitation is the Higgs boson. And that's why we were so keen on finding it, because it, shows that this field exists and therefore that this idea of brown label and the Higgs actually is realized in nature. And the standard model is very high, I and mean, the prediction was that it's going to be here. And, and this could, it had to be somewhere close because it had to be near enough to that energy scale of the unification to actually make things work. So we knew that the Large Hadron Collider, when we built it, would either find this Higgs or prove that that theory was wrong, which is a very nice situation to be in as a research scientist. You know you will answer the question. 
you obviously don't know what the answer is, but you know your experiment is capable of answering it. And the standard model is very, is very much over constrained, right? It's, um, it, it's, this is a, this is from March 2012, which if you know your, your amazing physics events is a few months before we announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. So it's the last word on the standard model without the Higgs being known about. And what it's showing you is if you, if you look at all the precision measurements we have, uh, including the ones that are least well known, which is the mass of the top quark and the mass of the W boson, and you include your S calculations with all the quantum corrections where the Higgs can even sort of enter in loops occasionally, even if you don't know it's there, you can put it in in the theory. Then it was telling us that the Higgs, the direct surface for the Higgs had ruled out all the white bits from this, so it could be in the gray bands. And then the indirect calculations were telling us it had to be in all these ellipses. So there's really quite a small area where it could be at that point. You can imagine it was quite tense. If it hadn't been there, then we would have broken the standard model. Um, and that was March, and uh, I'll, I'll come to uh, no spoilers. The LHC did its job, basically. This is the Large Hadron Collider, um, or at least the site of the LHC. This is Mont Blanc on the horizon, Lake Geneva here. It's spread forward, it's sort of zigzagging around here. And I don't know, I never know if I'm not in London whether I should use this analogy, but it's 27 kilometers is the, I know some of you from London anyway. Um, the, the, the 27 kilometers is basically the length of the circle line. And if you know your tube map, it's even the right color. So you can see with the whole of zone one London that's inside our experiment. Um, and what we have in there is it's underground, obviously. So don't go looking for the, the don't go looking for the yellow line if you're flying into the new airport. Um, but it's full of superconducting magnets. It has two highest energy beams of particles we've ever seen going in opposite directions, counter circulating and being brought into head-on collision at four points, CMS, LHCB, Atlas, and Alice. Your group in, in the Cavendish are, um, are major collaborators on LHCB and on Atlas, which is the experiment I also work on. And then CMS, um, there's a lot less UK institutions on there, I think, because Imperial are on it and no one wants to work with them. But the uh, London joke again, sorry. Um, but no, they're both, the, the Atlas and CMS are the general purpose experiments that were involved in finding the Higgs. The others have slightly different missions. Um, okay, and that's a kind of classic picture from 2005 when we were building Atlas. Time flies, it's ridiculous. Um, but I, I used to go give talks in schools, I still do. But when I used to go, this was on the wall in a lot of classrooms. It's one of those iconic physics pictures, I think, at some point. So given that that was, well, 17 years ago, some of you might have been in those classrooms, I guess. So anyway, that's our experiment being built. That's what the engineering drawing looks like now um, of Atlas. So the beams are coming in here and here, collisions happen here. These are your standard Swiss sized people to give you an idea of the scale. Um, it's really quite big. Um, I, a lot of you probably have visited CERN, I don't know, but if you do, if you do have a couple of hours to fill at Geneva Airport, it's worth popping into the visitor center, but you probably won't be able to go on the ground, especially not when it's running, without, you won't be able to go on the ground without an appointment. But there is stuff to see, even above now. And we get, of course, we read, there's a lot of different detector technologies here surrounding the collision point. There's the silicon detectors, there's, there's um, a calorimeter, which absorbs the energy and measures it. Um, there's then these things here, it's toroidal magnets to detect new ones, perhaps, perhaps through all the rest of the detector. I'm not going to go through the rest of uh, the detector in any way, really, but just to say, this is one of the ways you would represent those events, uh, a collision. So you've got to imagine this is a slice through that cylinder, and one of the beams is coming from the back of the room, one's coming from behind the screen. They collide here in the plane of the screen, and the blue lines are the fragments of bits of proton that go everywhere, hadrons basically produced in the collision. The, the yellow blobs are the things of interest in, in this case, because they have no, no line pointing to them, which means that they're not a charged particle, because if they were charged, you'd see them in, in the tracking sector. And they deposited all their energy in this green circle here, which is the electromagnetic calorimeter. So they're basically photons. They're, they're neutral and they're electromagnetic. So they're photons. A pair of photons is one of the ways that a Higgs boson will decay if you make one. So a Higgs boson is extremely unstable, decays in something like 10 to the minus 25 of a second. Um, so you've got no chance of catching one and observing it directly. But what you can do is you can look at the things it can decay to. You can do some kinematics on, on the energy and angle of these guys. You can you can hypothesize. You say, well, if these two photons came from some particle rather than being produced in some other process in the LHC, then 
um, I can work out what its mass was. I don't even know if it was a particle, but I can say, well, if it was, this is its mass. And if you just do that with all your pairs of photons that you measure, and you plot that mass, then in the end, you would expect if there's a new particle in there that can decay to pairs of photons, you expect to see a clustering around that, that mass, basically a bump. So that's what we did. You see the date up here, 2011, 2012. Up here is the number of pairs of photons. This is the mass that you calculate from that pair of photons. And you can, if you've got good eyesight, see a bump emerging. The errors on here are statistical. So as we collect more data, they go down. And that's the one. That's the big photos on. Um, so, now, obviously, we have a lot more evidence than that now. But actually, if you do a, a, a statistical test, that already is something like one in a um, hundred million chances of that just being a fluctuation. It's a good exercise in, in scientific discipline. I remember we lost a lot of sleep over that at one point. But uh, you just see, you know, it's a regression to the mean. You see the points diverge, and then as you get more and more data, they, 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 the noise goes down. And some actual fundamental knowledge about the way the universe behaves is emerging in this bit of the book. And there were there were several other ways that things can decay, and we've seen it in all of them. It always has the same mass, it's always the same particle, everything stacks up with the similar model. So it's there. Before the LHC, we had that. Now we've kind of crossed this crucial landscape feature, this ridge, which had labeled the electromagnetic symmetry breaking scale, and we've discovered the Higgs. And of course, we haven't been idle in the last 10 years or so. Um, this is, as I said, the Higgs can decay in lots of different ways. This is a collection of the measurements of the mass from different final states, from different things it decayed to. Um, you see they all stack up with a mass of around 125 GeV, um, giga electron volts. So a proton is just under 1 GeV in mass equivalent. So it's pretty heavy compared to the proton, heavy for a fundamental particle. And then because it's responsible for mass, the way it couples to all the particles is determined by their mass. So you can plot, uh, as a function of particle mass, the coupling, um, the, the, the Higgs, we can measure those couplings, and we can, um, and then you see the plot here. And you can see that for the more massive particles where we have quite precise measurements already, that is very much in line with the fact that this particle is not just some random bump in the distribution, it's the particle responsible for mass. It is actually coupling in the way to these guys in a way that is proportional to fundamental mass. And we've been since then exploring above that energy scale. So way above the electroweak symmetry breaking scale, above the Higgs mass, measuring not only the Higgs itself, but also all the processes that the standard model now can predict. If it actually, if the Higgs hadn't been there, we'd have no prediction for what physics would be like up there, because we'd know the standard model was wrong. Now we've found the Higgs, we can make precise predictions, and we can test them. And, this is that kind of, I don't know, flies on the windscreen um, plot. But each one of these points is a measurement of a brand new physics process that no one's ever measured before, at least not in this energy regime, and comparing to the standard model. You can see that some of them are not that well measured, and there are, we're always watching these plots because if you see a deviation, you, know, you saw that point deviate and then come back. So these could still do that. But if the deviation grows, then this will be very interesting, and we don't know the answer yet. And that plot that I showed you before now looks like this. So that um, this whole ellipse thing here has collapsed down to this line because we know the standard model, the Higgs is there. The, the scale on here has shrunk enormously and a little bit here too. Um, you might know that the ellipses don't line up so cool anymore. This is um, the, the, the consensus <laughs> measurement from actually not last month, the beginning of this year now, um, from before. Even that is a little bit too high. It should really overlap with this purple line if the standard model is going to be completely consistent. But that's only the, the one sigma line, so it's like less than two sigma away, so we're not going to lose any sleep over that. The latest measurement, which came from the Tevatron after they took about 20 years processing their data, um, is up here. And if that's right, then there may be an issue with the standard model here. And this may be the first sign that it's beginning to crack once we go above this electrical symmetry breaking scale. So was it the last fundamental particle? I started with the electron, finished with the Higgs. Well, according to the standard model, yes, it's the last fundamental particle, actually. So the, luckily, there are reasons we don't stop particle physics. Um, otherwise, I'd be out of the job for looking for good one, at least. Um, but this, it's the last particle according to the standard model. But this, I, I'm showing this just because it's a cool picture, which you probably know is the, 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 um, the accretion disk around the black hole in the middle of a nearby galaxy where nearby is an astronomy term 
Um, but actually, and that's because gravity is not in the standard model. There are four fundamental forces, but only three of them, the weak force, the strong force, and electromagnetism, are in the standard model with a fully understood quantum field theory behind them. Gravity is not. So I could have said that is beyond the standard model. In fact, it didn't have to be. That's another case of science. They, they uh, didn't have to be uh, as, um, as exotic as the black hole to be beyond the standard model. Now, you could say I don't care about that. Um, the uh, general relativity solves gravity. That works perfectly well. Standard model does the rest. And the fact that they are bound to be in conflict once you get to super high energies near the Planck scale or something, I'm just not even going to worry about it. Now, that's not a great, that's not very satisfying for physicists anyway, but it also doesn't work because if you try and understand uh, galactic dynamics um, using general relativity in the standard model, you find the galaxies are rotating too fast. Uh, well, you find a number of things wrong, but the most the simplest one to explain is the galaxies are going too fast. And by that, I mean that the mass that, is, that we see in them is not enough to provide the center of the force to keep the stars going around at the speed they're going. So they should fly apart. Um, and it, so either general relativity is wrong, or there's more mass in the galaxies than the standard model gives us. And the favorite, because it turns out that Einstein was quite clever and it's quite tricky to change general relativity without breaking it completely. The favorite solution is that there's this stuff called dark matter is 80% of the mass of the universe. Um, but it's not a standard model, almost certainly not a standard model. Um, so that's kind of a mess. Um, if you're trying to, I said at the beginning, we're trying to understand what makes up um, the fundamental constituents of nature. We've just thrown away 80% of it because we don't know what it is. It's not in the standard model. And it gets worse, actually, because um, when, whenever we create matter and, anti matter and antimatter, we create what we need for an opposite amount. So that's built into the theory and, um, and observed experimentally. And um, that means if the, when in the Big Bang, Created all the matter in the universe, it could have created an equal amount of antimatter, and it's clearly not around in the universe at the moment. Um, so there, is, there has to be some asymmetry there. So even even the twenty percent of the matter that we 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 is in the standard model, we don't understand why it's still here because it should have been annihilated with an equal amount of antimatter at some point. So this is kind of embarrassing if you're, you're trying to understand fundamental constituents of the universe, and that's why, even though the Higgs is the last particle predicted by the standard model. Even though the standard model has scored a massive success by predicting the Higgs with this amazingly new objects and really, really brilliant, not just like finding just another fundamental force or just another quark, it's something completely qualitatively different. Nevertheless, the standard model is not is very far from being a theory of everything, even even if even by everything you mean explaining the phenomena we see around us. So essentially, we're off the map. Most of my career up till twenty twelve, anyway, we were. Um, we had a very clear map from the theorists. Go find the Higgs. That's the next thing on your to-do list. And many of them said, when you find the Higgs, straight away after that, you find supersymmetry or quantum gravity or extra dimensions, whatever it might be. They were dead right about this, totally wrong so far about this. And so I like to think it was sort of sitting on the edge of, uh, edge of the, the dock um, in, in, in Bonzonia down here, chatting with the theorists and gossiping about what, must, what weirdness must be out there. And not believing the word of what they say, and in the end, we just got to go and look. Okay, and that's really what the LHC this is the LHC, I guess, still exploring out there beyond the electroweak symmetry breaking scale. So, we can want to go and look. It's actually worth mentioning, coming back to the W mass, that there are things there are things to look at more carefully in the bits we do know, too. There are a bunch of little anomalies, it's not just the mass of the W that I showed you earlier. There are measurements from LHCB. And if you don't know that Val Gibson or someone in your department, you may well, some of you may know if you're working on this now, we could give you a great talk about what this plot means. All I'm going to say now is decision measurements from LHCB, which have very, very clear theoretical predictors in the standard model, don't agree very well with it. And there are reasons to think that might that's been growing for a while. There are reasons to be excited by it. There's a measurement also of the muons um, diamagnetic moment um, from Fermilab in the US, which doesn't agree. Um, with the standard model, that, that anomalous magnetic moment of the electron was kind of the, the clin clincher for QED, for finding QED, um, to calculate it super precisely. The muon one is also calculated very precisely, not quite as precisely, and measured similarly precisely, and they don't agree uh, very well. So these may be straws in the way, these may be pointers that actually we are approaching the limits of where the standard model actually runs out of steam. 
despite it having just scored an amazing success with the Higgs. So that, and that's really where I am with what I'm working on. We're, we're probing this energy frontier. We're in run three of the, of the Large Hadron Collider now. We have a high luminosity upgrade coming. What that means is we can't turn the energy up anymore, but we can turn the intensity up. So we can shrink the statistical errors further when we do that. Like the ones you saw in the plot. And this is a measurement we made recently. So this is, this is now kind of the maturity of the physics beyond looking at the LHC. Um, what you're looking at here, though, is a very similar kind of plot to what you've seen already. This is the mass. This time, it's the mass when you have events where you have four leptons, so two electrons and two muons, or four of each. And we just plot the mass here. It's kind of a fully complex scale because we want to show all the detail. And this is the cross section. And the reason this is cool is because there's so much going on in it. So here you've got a Z boson at 90 dB decaying to four leptons. Here you've got the Higgs decaying to four leptons via two Zs. Here you've got a threshold turn on where both these Zs can be real, so they can both have the right mass, but there's an increase in the cross section at that point. And there's a huge richness of physics going on there. And there's even theorists have written papers about why their best beyond the standard model theory explains that point there, which is kind of ambulance chasing at this stage, but it, you know, it shows you that people are, you know, the, the, every, there are lots of plots like this where we're kind of running out of stats and continually looking to see if there's some bump going to emerge as we shrink the stats down. That was a paper we, we published last year. I mean, now this is the bit where I got into specifically what I work on. Um, and well, that paper was, was one of the things, but uh, what I'm working on these days. And this is, uh, there's a couple of um, computer programs behind this, software packages behind this. Where the idea behind them, I think, is very simple, but the practice um, was not being done. So this thing called Rivet, which has a fancy acronym here, um, is a direct legacy, actually, from that experiment I did my, uh, um, my PhD on. And what it is, is a library of the analyses that we've done at the LHC, um, written in such a way that you can simulate the collisions and you can apply those analyses to your simulation exactly the way we applied them to the data. So basically, it means you can compare your theoretical prediction very accurately to the, the, the uh, measurement, which is kind of trivial and what we should be doing all the time. But some of these observables are actually not trivial and very complex, and there have been mistakes. So it's, a, it's just a way of speeding up the process. It's not, as I say, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's very effective and it, and it gets a lot of physics out. Um, and then this thing, which is constraints on the theories using Rivet, is taking the power of those comparisons they're saying not only will we test the standard model with them, but we, we know that for some of the new theories that people come up with, the, the results of those theories would be visible in things we've already made it. And we need to know that rather than spend that waste our time going looking for something that actually something we've already measured tells us is not there. And again, that really you think about it, that kind of should be, that should be obvious. It should be what everyone should be doing, but actually it's not being done. It wasn't being done. Um, with all these measurements. It was being, it's being done with things like the W mass and B minus two, it's exactly that game. You compare a prediction with the measurement, but with these complex observables, it was not being done simply because the observables were a bit too complex and working out, translating the new model into those complex observables was quite a hard job. So these two software packages do that for you. So now as a theory or an experiment, there's no excuse, you can just grab these packages, take your theory and see whether it's viable still or not. This is an example of one that's not, for instance. So this is something we measured. This theory predicted a bump here. It's clearly not there. So that theory is wrong. And you, you know, repeat, repeat, rinse and repeat for lots and lots of theories. And the fact that we've not found any beyond the standard model, none of the favored candidates for beyond the standard model physics at the LHC yet, means theorists never give up. So it means there's a whole range of them there. There's no way you could go and do a dedicated one for each. You need to do this kind of thing. So that's what we've been doing. This shows you that it's work. It works. If you like, this is a, an exclusion plot. So everything to, below this line or to the left of this line is excluded for two different models. One is a dark matter model. One is a, um, a model with an exotic new force, a new force carrier in it. The other, I'm, not, I'm going to spend a bit more time on some other models in a minute. But the only reason to show you this plot is that the um, the, the dotted lines here come from these programs using the measurements that I just told you about. The solid line comes from dedicated circuits that take years. And it shows you that if you make the measurements properly, you do essentially just as well by making the measurements and then using these programs. 
you do as well as you do by making a dedicated set for this particular theorist's idea. So that's the kind of general overview. And if um, if the rest of the stuff goes a bit fast and is a bit too technical, I apologize, but really the important messages are in the bit I've already told you. Um, but I, I can't resist showing you some work that we're working on right now anyway. Uh, so I'm going to show you three examples of theories that we've, we've confronted with, with this, these tools. So one of them is uh, Z, this Z prime model. Now Z prime just means it's like the Z boson, but a bit different. Someone's made a new one up to explain stuff. And the stuff they're trying to explain in this case is those anomalies from LHCB that I mentioned earlier, where, where there's the, these decay rates don't quite stack up um, with the standard model. And you can explain them by introducing a Z prime that, put, that connects bottom and strange ports like this. And that feeds in through the decay rates, through the quantum correctness of the decay rates, and gives you something that agrees much better with the data if this happens. And these guys, um, actually, Ben Allen, because also he's in dance, he's here, um, is, a, is a friend of mine. And um, these ellipses here are the result of his fit to those anomalies. And they're telling you what this coupling parameters of the mixing angles in this theory are. So these essentially, don't, I'm not going to go in detail what, what they mean for the Z prime, but they're essentially how the Z prime couples into the standard model. Okay, what, what can it have? Obviously, it has a mass, and then it has, has a way of coupling into the standard model. So this is no longer, these are the kind of, these things all agree better with the data than the standard model. And if, if this turns out to be right, then it might be in line for a Nobel Prize, but I wouldn't put money on it. <laughs> so the very signature of this is you make a Z prime and it decays to a pair of new ones. Um, and so, and without and in the high um, Z prime mass region, there's a, a search. Um, so this is now the mass of that Z prime against the remaining free parameter once you've constrained it with Ben's fit uh, coupling parameter. And the data excludes a bit up here to the top left. So maybe you should put money on Ben getting a Nobel Prize because all this bit of this theory is still allowed, and it may well there may well be something there. There was an interesting low allowed region between these two um, blue dashed lines here. Um, there was allowed, and it's quite low mass, so that was kind of of interest. It was interesting that such a low mass Z prime could actually hide from all the direct searches, but it could, partly because it was close to the real Z prime, the one that's in the standard model, so it was hard to pick out from the background. But it turns out that our precision measurements of the Z prime and related cross sections are enough to exclude most of that region. So everything above and right of this white line is excluded. So there's a little bit of low mass region where there might be some hope for events theories, but most of that region is ruled out. But if you make the Z prime go up in mass, then there's plenty of room for it. So these are the kind of games people are playing. They're looking for clues in the data um, to give them to map on some kind of ideas about how you'd extend the standard model to describe the data better, and then seeing what other consequences of those new things would be. And we're testing some of those other consequences, basically. So there's another um, pass, very generic passive model. There are many, many models um, where you uh, just introduce some extra light scale that looks like a Higgs, and it decays to other particles by some effective vertex that you don't say much about, apart from that there's some energy scale associated with it, what we call yeah. um, lambda. And you can play with, you can make very generic models where you have this, this scale as being either CPR or CP even, CP being charge parity symmetry. So whether they're even or odd on the switching particle and antiparticle and, and left and right. And again, it's it's kind of a cultural model, but, it, but if these things exist, they can help you explain that matter. They can help you explain uh, CP odd, for instance, and, or some mixture of the two. They could help you explain baryon antibaryon asymmetry and, and, and therefore why where all the antimatter went. And so we looked at that too. And if you look here, you see this is Julian's work here. He's working with me at the moment as a final year undergraduate. Um, and um, these so these are plots we make. And this is the mass of that scalar here. And this is the scale of the coupling here. And everything below this black line is ruled out. And these bits up here are kind of allowed. And this is where you would expect to rule things out. So if you if you're a dreamer, you can think the fact that our sense to, that we didn't rule out this region, but we would have expected to rule out this region here. This dotted line is the expected limit. You could think that maybe this is a hint of something going on. 
Now we have reason to think that that's probably not the case in this case. We think it's an inadequacy in the standard model prediction. Nevertheless, that's the kind of thing that you hope will start happening. If you have an expected limit, then your actual limit doesn't agree with it. And then maybe that's a sign that there's a discrepancy in the data that might be showing you some standard model stuff, beyond the standard model stuff. And then the final example um, that I'm going to talk about is um, vector-like quarks. And I'm really trying this for a flat plot at the end. But vector-like quarks are a way of adding more quarks to the standard model. And then you can't add more quarks to the standard model. That you can't add more quarks that are just like the existing quarks. Because if they were, they'd have to get their mass from the Higgs. And if they're getting their mass from the Higgs, we'd have seen that in the Higgs, we'd see in the Higgs case. So we know that that's not the case. So the Higgs has already moved ruled out a whole bunch of extra fourth generation theories with an extra quark and that extra pair of quarks. However, if you make them vector like they don't have to get their mass from the Higgs, so you can dodge that, and that's typical theorist behavior, just dodge the data. Um, but they do appear in many well-motivated extensions of the standard model, and there are a lot of parameters in this model, which is the main reason for focusing on it. So Atlas has done some dedicated searches, and it had done a search where it ruled out this region where the Higgs decays to tops and Ws, um, and this region where it decays to Bs and Ws, this region here. Then we ran our, our program on the other things Atlas had measured that were not meant to search for vector-like quarks, we're just measuring what happened. And we rule out everything to the bottom left of this white line and everything in here. So one message from that is that there's a huge complementarity. When you're doing a search, you try and stay away from the, where the standard model cross-section is large. When you're doing a measurement, you're measuring this large cross-section. And if you put the two together, you get much better coverage of this unknown physics. Um, but the cool, I, I'm going to just skip over that now um, to get to the end. But to this addendum, because it gives you some illustration of the power of the thing. So during the journal review for that paper, we got um, a, a referee comment that said, this is great, but it's a bit of a pity that they chose to use these particular combinations of vector-like quarks because they don't cover all the all the theoretically favored ones. Some of the ones they looked at are probably theoretically not, not very favorable anyway. And some of the, some really favorable ones they didn't cover. So we took this to heart and we thought about it. They said, you know, they should have looked at singlets with these two. There are four possible quarks. And they said they should have looked at the B and C on their own, these pairs of doublets and these triplets, because those are all much better theory motivated than the ones they looked at. So we thought, okay, well, that's, seven times three times four a lot of combinations but we turned our little boat into a speedboat and we did it all in two weeks from the journal from the, the referees report to resubmit into the journal just by changing our parameters and rerunning those each one of those plots would be essentially a, a year's work for a dedicated search so we you know, shows you the power of the way we're doing physics uh, at the moment with this kind of stuff so Unfortunately, we didn't find any vector like quarks, that would have been even more exciting, but we, we managed to narrow down the, the possibilities a lot. So where are we now? There are no like agreed favorite extensions to the standard model. Um, before the LHC, you could, you could have taken a poll of 100 theorists and 95 of them which least would have said supersymmetry is gonna be there. Um, it's not there yet. Uh, it's probably not there at all in my view, um, because it really should have appeared quite near the Higgs boson if it was gonna be there. Um, I mean, it might be up at the string scale if strings are real, but who cares? It's not going to be seen at the LHC, basically. <laughs> um, so there's no favorite extension, but there's a lot of ideas that connect these various anomaly, anomalous phenomena that are showing up, including the matter antimatter symmetry and gravity and um, neutrino masses. And um, what was the other one I was talking about? Kind of that matter, of course. And, and then these anomalies that we're seeing at LHCB and, and the W mass. And, all these are scores in the wind that people are trying to put better, bigger theories together that will contain the standard model, but will do more. And that's the that idea. So I think we need this change of approach. We're, we, we're exploring now. We're no longer testing a single best theory like the Higgs was like the standard, when we were testing the standard model. We now need to explore and we need wide coverage. We need to be humble in the sense that we know there's no guarantee that any of these things will actually be there. Um, but in order to do this, we need the predictions from the standard model and we need to make our measurements in a theory neutral way. There is no guarantee we'll find that stuff, but the guarantee is that we'll find out whether the Higgs is really doing what it wants. And there's key things like the shape of this potential I haven't really discussed here, but we'll, there are key things we still don't know about the Higgs and we will find those out. 
Um, you can ask me about what they are after if you like. Um, we will also find out whether or not the standard model continues to apply far, far to the east in those maps, far, far when it was invented right in the west and it applies right over here, up to super high energies, way above where it is qualitatively new regular physics. That's actually an interesting thing to know about nature. It might say be more interesting to find a Z prime or something or a vector like what and solve some of these open questions, but knowing whether or not the standard model continues to work is actually a really important fact of nature. We, can, we don't get to choose what nature is doing, but we can go and look. And, and we'll also push some amazing technologies which I haven't addressed at all, but there's a lot going on uh, there in the technological development. And there may be really big surprises as we do that as well. Okay, so the, the question summing, the question not really, is this a standard model isolated? Is this archipelago or the whole thing? Or is a whole bunch of stuff out there waiting to be discovered? The only certain thing is that if we don't go look, we'll never know the answer to that. And I just finished by saying that these maps are from my book and they're by this guy, Chris Wilmer, I know you to acknowledge him, Chris, so brilliant. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Professor Butterworth, for the amazing talk. It was really interesting. And we now open to questions to our audience and as well as our audience on the YouTube uh, live stream. Uh, if you have any questions, then just like raise your hand. But also, uh, after the questions uh, sessions, we have uh, like wine reception out there. We have a snack and we have a and in the future. And uh, if there are no questions yet, we have a question from YouTube. Uh, so there are two questions from the top. So first one is, is there any theory that has been massively popular quotes in that in particular generation from 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 particular generation and there are some theories that explain some of the other hierarchy. Obviously, none of these theories are proven yet, but they, they, they exist. In particular, there are some theories that prove that, that, that explain very naturally why the neutrinos are so super light below, below even the electron mass. And also actually explain that W mass anomaly. They're, they're called seesaw models, the TAC2 seesaw model in particular. It means anyone, anything to anyone. Something I'm, I'm actually working on now with my contour kit. Um, so yeah, there, there are attempts to do that. I don't think there's a single theory that explains them all. Bang, 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 bang. You know, like a, like gets up. So I just start that maybe. Um, that explains them all, absolutely. But there are theories that explain aspects of that and get it qualitatively right. It's a bit weird, right? Everyone thinks the top quark is is the weird one because it's so heavy, but actually the top quark in many ways is the only natural one because the mass comes from the coupling to the, the Higgs, and the Higgs coupling is a dimensionless number. So you think like one is probably somewhere between 0.1 and one or 0.1, 0.1 and 10 is kind of a natural place for the number to be without fine tuning it. And the top coupling is called the Yukawa coupling is about one. That's why the top mass is pretty close to the Higgs mass. The weird thing really is why is the electron so light? Because it's, it's got a coupling of very, very, you know, very, very small coupling to the Higgs. And that's kind of less natural than the top in a way. And the neutrinos are even worse. Okay, so another question. What could this quantity about the energy stable, such as the inexplicable amount of the quantity of energy when the order of quantity stable? Say that again, sorry. What could then constitute about the energy stable, such as the inexplicable amount of the quantity of energy when the order of quantity stable? Right. So that's that, that's what why basically why the big gap is why is the Higgs. Um, why is the electroweak scale down at a few hundred GeV and the next natural scale is the Planck scale? Why it's true. So behind that question is the fact that if you calculate the quantum correctness to the Higgs mass, they're very not, they're, they're quadratic and they very naturally make it blow up to super high, up, up as far as wherever your cutoff scale is, which could be the Planck scale. Um, so no one knows is the quick answer. And one of the big, and if I'd have asked this before the LHC turned on, 99% of the theorists in the room would have said supersymmetry because that introduces new particles that cancel the quantum. So because it introduces fermion for every boson and they come in with opposite signs in the quantum correction, then once you get above the Susy breaking scale, they all cancel. So every every loop one way has a negative loop as well. 
Um, that's another reason for the vector-like walk type models. Actually, they can do that because the, these vector-like walks come into the loops as well, and then they can they will cancel the corrections from the walks. And that's the feature of a lot of models is that they try and explain that cancellation and make the make the gap between the the um, the electric symmetry breaking scale and the next new physics scale smaller. Basically, extra dimensions also try to do the same because if you make gravity propagate in extra dimensions, that brings the Planck scale right down to the electroweak scale. So rather than doing cancellations, you actually just change the Planck scale. You say that at some point you, you activate these extra dimensions, you can dissolve the extra dimensions, and at that point, gravity, quantum gravity comes into play much earlier, and the Planck scale effectively comes down. So there are lots of ideas. It's a very live theoretical problem, but no one knows the answer. I just want to be curious. Any other questions? Um, so I have a question as well. So like uh, I was wondering with like Lutheran and like the Fermi lab, do uh, you know of any other like large scale collaborations to sort of discover more about the model? Yeah, for sure. So there's um running at the moment, actually Fermilab does not have um a collider running at the moment. And isn't planning one at the moment. What it is doing is building a, a high intensity neutrino beam. Um, because one of the things I focused on the energy frontier, but actually the neutrino sector, it's only, it's only in the late 90s that we discovered. I mean, neutrinos are really physically on the standard model. In the, in the original version of the standard model, neutrinos had no mass. We now, as of Super Cameo Canada and the Snow experiment in Canada, we do now know that they have mass, but we don't know. We don't know that that mass is to do with the Higgs, for instance, actually. And we, we also, we, there, there are very many other unknowns. There also could be a big source of matter antimatter asymmetry coming from the neutrinos. So that's, an, that's a very exciting frontier, not the energy frontier that I was talking about. That's where Fermilab is concentrating now. And there's also an experiment following on from Super Kamikande in Japan, um, J Park firing a, a neutrino beam to um, hypercate, hypercamicande, even bigger neutrino detector. So those are on, will be coming in the next few years. They're, they're on the construction there. Um, there's there's no other big collider. Um, there's no other energy frontier. The only place we can get to the energy frontier is CERN. Uh, um, the, the experiment I went on in Hamburg was the last big collider that was built in Europe outside of CERN. It was in Daisy in Hamburg. Yeah. Um, but they have gone now. They've turned themselves into a light source laboratory. And likewise, Stanford, Slack had one of these, but it's also now a light source laboratory because these accelerators are useful for a lot of other things too. Um, so really CERN is the energy frontier place at the moment. There are proposals for next generation after the LHC. Um, the LHC will run with its high looming thing for another 20 years or something. So I'll be retired, but we're already thinking about what we might do next um, or what might not come after it. CERN has a plan for an even more powerful collider, as you might expect. Um, and there are also plans in China to do something similar. Um, and uh, there's also a discussion of a linear collider, which could be, I mean, the favorite site at the moment is Japan, but it could also be built elsewhere. So these are the kind of options that are being played with. But the only one functioning at the energy frontier now is the Lab Hadron Collider. Um, so for the Z-Pine uh, photon, well, like if that was synthesis, how would that change the gauge group or at least the model? How would it change the gauge group? Yeah. So it would be another gauge group. So all these, it would be an additional. So um, the gauge groups are the, 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 the symmetries that underlie each force in the standard model. So if you see the standard model described as U1 plus SV2 plus SV3, those are three gauge groups, which um, each, each of the forces comes from one of those. So if you have a Z prime, it's usually another U1. Um, the one, uh, it's something, to, it's, there's a global flavor symmetry in Ben Malinette's model that I was looking at there. And you take that global flavor symmetry and make it local and gauge it. And that's where you get the Z prime from. Um, so, and that's very typical. There's another model I worked on with a colleague in UCL um, where the baryon number minus lepton number is a global symmetry of the standard model. And you actually make that gauge symmetry, and then you get a, a Z prime from that as well, which is basically like a photon on the on the heavy. So it's that kind of game that people are playing. Whenever that's really what we say when, if you do, if you talk about this in the media and stuff, sometimes which we do occasionally, they say, is it a new particle or a new force? And at some level, they're the same thing, but they're different because the Z prime is a particle and the force carrier. 
but the difference really is does it have a gauge group behind it so I, obviously you don't say that on the today program <laughs> but um, that's what we mean as physicists does it have a gauge symmetry underlying it or not so when we say z prime we usually mean something with a gauge symmetry behind it but it'll be a new one it's not one of the standard model existing ones okay. Uh, there are no more questions. We uh, uh, just so thank you for uh, Professor Butterfield for giving us this talk again, and we'll see you guys at the wine reception. And also, just uh, another information we are um, offering our memberships still out there as well. So, if you're considering that, you can um, find our community out there. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.